Soros for inviting me to this uh, conference and to describe the work that we've been doing uh, at the University of Guelph, which if you wonder where it is, it's not far from uh, Toronto. We're like 50 miles west of Toronto. It's a, a small city, university city, Guelph. So, uh, so the, 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 the theoretical context in which I will place this work, it's trying to uh, get at a very basic question, is what makes a reinforcer reinforcing? We know what they do, but why they do what they do, it's the type of question that, that psychologists have been after for quite some time. And uh, so if you, if you in fact think about the definition is what puzzles us, how can uh, behavior be different after it's been reinforced in the absence of reinforcer, because that's essentially what the habit is, in a sense. Um, so when you think about this, then you, the answer to this, it's pretty straightforward. There must be a memory somehow. So memory must be involved. So the, the hypothesis, or at least the set of it, well, it's a really a strong hypothesis, I suppose, that has been uh, proposed to explain uh, the action of reinforcers and why they're reinforcing uh, was uh, proposed by uh, Norman White and Peter Milner in this paper, The Psychobiology of Reinforcers. Peter Milner just passed uh, a, few, a few months ago. Um, and they, uh, in this paper, they mentioned that the reinforcers need to do at least two different things. One thing they do, they enhance memory. This is one function they have. Uh, they enhance the acquisition and storage of information in the brain. And the second function is that uh, reinforcing stimulus usually attributes motivation to other stimuli that are neutral. And that's what learning is about, is learning, uh, is, is knowing that some stimuli are predictors of other stimuli. And in this case, are predictors of motivational stimuli. So this is a... Uh, a visual representation of the hypothesis. So everything begins into various environmental stimuli and various environmental responses that are produced in the context of the stimuli, normal behavior, I guess, in the environment. After a behavior is performed with certain stimuli, the hypothesis states that there will be a memory trace of that experience. So a representation in the brain of that event and the responses and the stimuli. So it's a it's a memory representation. If the memory trace is followed in time by the delivery of a reinforcer, a reinforcing stimulus, the reinforcing stimulus will do two things. First, it will strengthen the memory trace itself. So that's the, uh, I guess, your left dimension here. I mean, I can use the mouse here as a point. So this will be the memory enhancing effect of the reinforcer. Reinforcer occurs here, and it essentially strengthens the memory trace, makes it stronger, more permanent. And the second function that I discussed is that the reinforcer um, essentially embeds or attributes motivational value to the various stimulus and even the responses that were performed prior to the delivery of the reinforcer. So these are the two functions. The hypothesize this functions of, uh, of uh, reinforcers, and um, we've been testing them both, essentially. Not only us, others have done too. So uh, let me first describe uh, this uh, uh, loop, the memory, en memory enhancement, and um, um, let me show you how this is usually tested in animals. So in animals, you have to select some kind of a learning task. Uh, up there I have the, the super maze of <laughs> Dr. White. It's an automated real alarm maze. You put a rat in there and the computer controls opening doors, closing doors, and the animals have to remember where sucrose is. And if, you know, they have to remember in this arm, that arm, whatever task you're doing. The point here is that you train the animals on, on this task. And then when you get the animals out of the maze, that's where you de deliver a reinforcer or, or any stimulus that you try to find out if that stimulus can change memory. So you're acting on the period of memory consolidation, essentially. The idea is that 
being in the maze, doing particular actions creates a memory. That memory is essentially builds up and it's re we represent in changing performance and learning. And right after the animal has performed that task, you can deliver your stimulus. In this case, it would be, is this reinforcing or not? You deliver the stimulus post-training. It's not part of the training, it's given post-training. And then you reassess the, the, essentially, you retest the memory of the animal quite some time following that period. And what you notice is that when you give a reinforcer post-training, and by reinforcer I mean either food, uh, stimulation of some regions of the brain, or delivery of drugs of abuse, you improve uh, the, the performance on this task on a, on, a, on a subsequent test. So this is the post-training method essentially. And uh, most drugs of abuse enhance memory this way. Amphetamine does, cocaine does, morphine and heroin do, caffeine, alcohol, benzodiazepines, including benzodiazepines, and, and of course nicotine, and, and that's what I'm here to discuss. So um, I just pulled out a, a few studies. I'm not gonna go through this, this is no point, but um, this is a review that we did of the studies maybe three years ago. This is an internal review. We just looked at uh, uh, situations where animals, rats or mice received nicotine after being trained on a variety of different tasks that have nothing to do with nicotine self-administration, nicotine th training, so passive avoidance, habituation to a novel uh, environment, object recognition, uh, Morris water maze, swimming. Uh, there's even work in honeybees. Honeybees that are discriminating uh, smells, I believe, I'm not an expert, but, and then post-training they received intra, uh, what is it, antennal lobe, I'm not really sure about the, neuro the neurobiology of the brain of an honeybee, but they were injected with nicotine and uh, they, they do better at the discrimination uh, when you retest them drug-free. There's more um, mice, and in general, in general, the results are consistent. There is an enhancement in retention. Um, in humans, it can be done as well, and it has been done. Same type of idea. Of course, you don't put them in a maze. <laughs> you have them learn a sequence of words, images. There's been done in different studies, different ways in different studies. But there is a training phase. You expose them to these words. Uh, and then post-training, you allow them, well, in this case, to smoke. Uh, you control it for the doses, or you allow them to drink alcohol. Uh, usually, that's what the studies have been done like that. And then, a little point in time, you test for recall, and uh, they do better. So these are a few studies in the human. Um, uh, so these are the, usually they're, they're we're done having people smoking cigarettes and. And there's either no effect or enhanced retention. So the results are consistent. So <coughs> the other dimension of, uh, of this uh, is the, the fact that when the reinforcer is experienced following a uh, behavior, following a cue, following uh, the relationship between the behavior and the cue, then those cues and those behavior are altered in, in the motivational value that they have. Um, now, in animals, uh, there are several ways of testing this, but the most traditional way is to uh, use compartments like this. This is, I actually found this picture on uh, uh, Wikipedia, and it's a picture that, of my lab, and I have no idea how I got up there, <laughs> so I, I don't know, <laughs> but these are my condition place preference chambers. And uh, the typical situation here is that uh, the one of the, the, the boxes is associated with uh, the effects of a drug. Uh, the, the box just beside it is associated with the effects of nothing, a vehicle. And you do this a few times. And then, uh, and then uh, you essentially check where the animal spends more time. And, and what you find is that they spend much more time in the environment that was previously associated with the drug. Um, and uh, so in this case, it's important that the, the, the terminology or we call the, the, the drug pair context the CS plus. It means that it's a condition stimulus contextual. Condition stimulus plus, it means that it's associated with a drug effect. 
and then we have a CS minus that there is no drug effect. Um, and in this case situations, uh, and, and uh, Bernard Lefall and Steve Goldberg wrote a review in 2009, reviewing all the condition per spectrum literature in rats and mice. You can get it. You can get it depending on exactly how you do it, but nicotine does produce a condition per spectrum, depending how you do it, but you get it as well. So that nicotine can impart value to condition stimulus, to stimulate the environment. It's fairly well known. And I'm not even going to try to review uh, the human literature because, I mean, <laughs> most of you are very familiar with those kind of effects. And we will hear more about that in, in this context. But uh, here I would like to uh, then pause and, and tell you where my hypothesis is. So the hypothesis uh, proposed by uh, uh, White and Mi uh, Milner is that the reinforcer enhances memory and uh, attributes motivational value to stimuli. The hypothesis that I've been testing lately is that a conditioned stimulus has the same effect. So, so not only a primary reinforcer can do that, but also a conditional reinforcer can do that. And that's what we've been testing. So we're essentially being comparing whether a cocaine, whether cocaine or a cocaine condition stimulus enhance memory, whether heroin or heroin condition stimulus enhance memory, or whether nicotine or a nicotine condition stimulus enhance memory. And that's what I'm presenting today, of course, the, the, the nicotine work. So everything is done in Sprog Deli's male rats. It's important. You need to know the, the strain and uh, the, the sex of the animals. We've never tested females, not because of lack of interest, it's primarily because of lack of funding. <laughs> Eventually we'll get to that too. And uh, so the task that we use to, to test uh, our memory effect is the spontaneous object recognition task. So it's done on a Y maze, looks like a Y. It's called like that. So ideally, so ideally, initially the animal <coughs> is placed here and then they're given time to explore two objects that are on the one, uh, on the at the end of the two arms, in this, uh, in this case is a tennis ball and they are, they are identical objects. And then in the normal, the way you do this task, a few, a few hours later, usually the 24, or depending, that's important, the time interval in between. You put the animal back in the, in the Y maze sensitive mouse, sorry. Uh, and you switch one of the objects. And what you find is that the rat will spend more time investigating those, the object that you switched. They, they seem to be sensitive to novelty. They explore more novel objects when they are in a safe environment, usually. And you can calculate a discrimination ratio of how much they explore the new object versus the old object. And that's an index of how, how well they remember their, the new, the, 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 this is a new object in versus what they experienced before. So the discrimination ratio is calculated on the choice phase. Now rats are pretty good at this. If you put a short delay in between the sample phase and the choice phase, 24 hours usually you get a good memory for what they've seen. But if you stretch this to about 72 hours in this maze, normal animals don't do very well. They don't really give you a discrimination ratio that is above zero. And so they, they, to, they investigate the two objects as if they've never been seen before. So in this experiment, then what we do, we give our post-training administration following the sample phase. We either give nicotine or exposure to the nicotine condition stimulus plus or even exposure to the CS minus. This is a within subject design. So this, the same animals are tested uh, with the CS plus and the CS minus. And then we do two different treatment periods. And that's an important control that has to be done in this kind of studies. We either give, we give the manipulation immediately post training or we delay it by six hours. The idea here is that the memory of the training is active only for a period of time. That's a critical period of the memory. And if you go beyond that time, you are outside of the window of consolidation, so your manipulation should have no effect. And it's a very important control because from a point of view of pharmacology and exposure to the stimulus, the animals have the same experiences. It just is outside of the window. 
So the delay control group is very important to demonstrate selectivity to uh, consolidation. So um, these are the effects of uh, nicotine at various doses. Down here you have the doses that we tested. These are IP injection, single dose, one injection, vehicle 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4, discrimination ratio, sample size, choice phase, and you can see that there is a dose-dependent effect as we increase the effect uh, the, the dose of, of nicotine. We enhance the discrimination ratio in a 72 hours interval. So the animals are displaying learning, um, especially specifically when we administer with nicotine post training. So then we did, and this we kind of expected. It was demonstrated in a different way, but we, we expected this. This is the novel experiment here. Uh, so here you, we have animals that we put into those boxes uh, five times, or actually ten times in total. Once you know, we give them nicotine injection, in this case we selected the 0.4, which was the dose that was effective in the acute study. And up there on the top here, what you see is the locomotion that the animals display when we put them in the boxes that we injected either with nicotine or with vehicle. So they get five pairings in total. So this is the first pairing. And you see that the locomotion response to nicotine on the first, on the first pairing is pretty much equivalent to the, uh, the, the, the effect of the vehicle in the CS minus. And these are the same rats. Remember, they're the two compartments. By the last pairing, now we see a, a clear dissociation in terms of locomotion. Nicotine at this point is, is, stimula is stimulating the behavior. What B is, B is when we put the animals back in those chambers in the absence of nicotine. So here we put the animals back in the CS plus for the first time in the absence of nicotine and we're essentially looking for conditioned locomotion. And you can see that nicotine produces a conditioned hyperlocomotion response. This is over the session time, it's 30 minutes. Most of the effect is the initial portion of the session, the first 10 minutes. So we have a conditional response that we can measure that is locomotion. And so essentially what we have asked in this experiment is that what if the animals have the sample phase of object recognition just prior being placed in the CS plus for that 30 minutes period. And then we retested them uh, after exposure to the CS minus, we did the same thing. And these are the effects. So uh, is exposure to the CS plus, the nicotine pair uh, conditional stimulus was quite efficient in enhancing the discrimination ratio, indicative therefore of an enhancement of memory consolidation. So <coughs> these are the results of the uh, delayed uh, experiments where we delayed the nicotine injection by six hours. We lost the discrimination effect, well, the effect on discrimination ratio. Uh, we also delayed exposure to the CS plus and also in that case, there was no memory enhancing effect. And uh, the last um, uh, sets of data that I would like to show you is, is where we verified whether the same condition stimulus will be able to attract the animal, whether that stimulus in fact had acquired condition motivational properties. And it did. So this is a, a condition price preference study. So we essentially asked, we did the same study but now we're finding out whether the animals spend more time in the CS plus versus the CS minus on test. And they do. So at this dose, in this conditioning type of situation, we get a robust condition price preference with nicotine. So then uh, the conclusion from this is that uh, uh, similarly to acute nicotine, a, uh, a nicotine paired stimulus, in this case is a context, so it's a co contextual conditioning. That context does indeed enhance memory consolidation and also has the ability to, to attract the animal, indicating that has acquired the condition motivation. So this is the PhD work of my student, uh, Michael Walner, Walter and uh, Andrew Hoff, and my collaborator on uh, the object recognition task is uh, Boyer Winters. And that's the source of funding, National Science and Engineering Council of Canada. Thank you. Thanks for a great set of studies and the presentation. Uh, question? Jed. Thank, thanks for that uh, really lucid presentation.
presentation, and, and one thing that comes to my mind is is harking to some of these uh, you know supposed extinction type studies of putting people on, let's say, a denicotinized cigarette as an extinction treatment, but you know as a CS plus, which presumably the cues of smoking are, by your work that might just be expected to continue to maintain the memory associations, uh, and and not really be extinction at all. Uh, but my question is that of these two effects uh, of both nicotine and, and associated condition cues, the one to enhance memory and then the other to create a positive motivational valence, uh, have you looked to see is there an actual correlation you know, within animals? Or are they two dissociable influences or do they uh, tend to go together? Uh, the animals who show most memory enhancement also show more motivational effects. Have you had a chance to look at that? No, that's an excellent question. That's something that I always wondered about. No, because we didn't do that in the same animals. That was done in different animals. Um, uh, so I don't have an answer to that, but I have answer to, an answer to your first point, because we actually wondered what would happen to the memory enhancing effect of the CS plus that has been extinguished. Can you actually extinguish that that? that conditional response in a sense, right? Now we didn't do it with nicotine cues, we did it with heroin cues, because we did ex exactly the same experiment with using heroin. So <clears throat> we exposed the animals to that CS plus, that condition environment, 11 times it took us. And we used locomotion as one conditional response that we can monitor to gauge extinction. So it took about, in that study, it took about 11 exposures to the CS plus to have the conditional locomotion come down. And then we retested the memory enhancing effect of the CS plus and it was retained. So I guess, uh, uh, you know, it, it illustrates that not all conditional responses extinguish at the same rate. And as, as much as the DCS retain the ability of, uh, of uh, the, the ability of DCS is to, to modulate memory can be, can be quite persistent. Uh, we didn't do it with nicotine, so we just don't know if the same relationship applies to other drugs. Um, but we didn't, yeah. Sorry. Other questions? I have a question. Um, and it has to do with uh, enhancing the extinction process. Mm. Uh, have you tried uh, drugs that are non-nicotinic, thinking that, well, you know, with nicotine facilitating its own addiction, that maybe you'd be best extinguishing with another cognitive enhancer like methylphenidate or oh. memantine uh, that are mediated through other transmitter systems? Yeah, well, <coughs> you know, when you start to talk about uh, systems, okay, so, we attempted, we're now working to give an answer to what you're saying, <laughs> we, and it's a convoluted answer, but at the, at the, I guess the, the, the basic answer is that perhaps there are some systems that are common to all of them. So no matter what your initial pharmacology is, you may end up acting on a common system. So we started to work on, um, on uh, the beta adrenergic system, propanolol, we started to use that. And we have ascertained that propanolol can block the memory enhancing effect of both nicotine condition cues and cocaine condition cues. Now we're testing heroin. So, so we're, getting to the, we, we're getting really to think that no, no matter what the drug is, at some point you get to some kind of circuit. And there are some hypotheses about the, that what, what the circuit may be, that it doesn't really matter what the drug is because it's a common system of, of memory enhancement. That's an hypothesis to test. They, they probably there are dissociation at some levels, but I'm not sure between drugs, that's gonna be the, the subject of my, my next grant. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. One more question, Steve. Uh, I'm thinking of your extinction of the CS plus. Mm -hmm. Given that the modern view of extinction is that nothing is ever unlearned, mm -hmm. uh, extinction is new learning, mm -hmm. Is it possible to show, let's say, through some recovery process that you can always get the CS plus to work its magic mm -hmm. um, by shifting context or any of the other myriad of things that we can do to get extinction to go away mm -hmm. and the original learning to reemerge? 
Yes, yes, of course. Uh, no, we haven't done it. But, and we still haven't, we have not extinguished the ability of a CS Plus to enhance memory. So we first have to make sure that we can find a way to make that go away. And then through spontaneous recovery, renewal, perhaps restatement, we could find out if that ability can be regained. Uh, I, the amount of work that can be done from that angle is, is, is definitely uh, is quite extensive. Uh, yeah, th that's a very good suggestion. Talk and some, uh, some great uh, initial discussion. I remind you again, we're going to have a couple of discussion periods, one at the end of the morning session and one at the end of the afternoon. So uh, now we'll proceed on to the next talk.